you know, having kids and living alone, having kids was a little, we just didn't have significance because if we had more people in our studies, we probably would have, um, those who might've been significant too. So living alone was a, like not significantly worse, but sort of a little worse than living with other people in terms of the hit you took and how lonely or connected you felt. So. Wow. Um, so let's take it back to the beginning. How did you decide to begin your research on, on happiness? Yeah. Well, it was actually serendipitous. So when I started grad school, I mentioned 89 was when I started. I started grad school was at Stanford University and um, in the Bay Area. Um, and the very first meeting I had with my advisor, his name is Lee Ross, and he is one of the world's experts on conflict and negotiation. So not kind of the opposite to happiness. And the very first meeting we had, we were talking about, like, we started talking about happiness. Like what, you know, why are some people happier than others? You know, what's the secret to happiness? And back then, 89, there was only really one person who was doing research on happiness. His name is Ed Diener. He's kind of the founder of the field. Um, but no one really else was doing it. it. It was considered a very fuzzy and unscientific topic to study. Um, so I, I was kind of insecure at first, you know, studying happiness because I felt like everyone else was I don't know, doing like really rigorous <laughs> research. And we were like interviewing people who are happy or unhappy. So that's, that's how it started. Oh. And Michael is back. Hold on one second. Oh. I am back. Hello, everybody. I'm on my iPhone. Hi, Sonia. Sorry I missed you. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, yeah. We've been having a great conversation without you. Great. I should, <laughs> I should go have a coffee or something. <laughs> so, um, for, you know, I, I had a whole long welcome, but I'm going to kind of skip that because the conversation started. Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying so far this lunch, and we have a few more this month. I just want to let you know about those things, Sonia, if you just excuse me to let, because we're going to have someone next week, you, pro you probably know, Maria Konnikova, mm. who, uh, Maria Konnikova, who wrote this book called The Big Bluff. She's a psychologist, and she decided to become a professional poker player and learn what she could learn, and now it's a bestseller. Uh, interesting person. And at the end of the month, we have Dr. Rachel Yehuda uh, from New York, who's done a lot of research on the transmission of trauma and resilience uh, across generations. Very interesting person. So I want to let people know that. So. Oh, uh oh, uh oh, we're frozen. Also, I don't know if people know, just put it in the chat line and Emily, who's on the boards, will be able to uh, call you to the screen. And when this is over, you'll receive a link and you can watch it again, tell your friends, whatever. So Sonia, um, just tell us a little bit about your research and what are the, some of the key findings about happy? Uh, yes, I, are oh, you frozen? But I should just keep talking, right, Emily? Um, yeah. So, I already uh, gave a little bit of introduction about my different areas of research, but I noticed in the chat someone asked about a definition of happiness, and I think that's a good place to start with. Yeah, hold on. Maybe we can mute. Yeah, I'm trying to mute her for some reason. Um, okay. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, the definition of happiness. So I define happiness, I guess, the way that researchers define happiness, starting with Ed Diener, who's kind of the founder of well-being science. And that the idea is that happiness has two components. And the way I like to think of these two components is being happy in your life and being happy with your life. So being happy in your life involves the experience of positive emotions on a frequent basis. Not all the time, of course. Negative emotions we know are also functional and important adaptive as long as they're not chronic or too intense. So pos experiencing positive emotions like joy, tranquility, curiosity, pride, affection um, on a regular basis. So that's, so frequent positive emotions is part of happiness, the hallmark of happiness some people might say. So that's being happy in your life. Being happy with your life would be having a sense that your life is good, that you're, grow that you're sort of getting along, uh, progressing towards your life goals, that you're satisfied with your life. So so a happy person is someone who's both kind of has f fairly frequent positive emotions and also is satisfied with their life. Oh, Michael is muted. Okay. So. Michael, can you unmute? <laughs> Sorry about okay, this. I'm back. There we go. He's back. Yes. 
And what, what makes some people happier than others? Yeah. Well, that's a, what, that's a billion dollar question. See people who are just happy. Oh. oh. Yeah, let's just start with that. What makes people happy? What makes some people happier than others? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, I guess, a big question. Um, I guess one way to answer that is that there are sort of different, there are different factors that contribute to happiness. Um, I guess I'll start with genetics because we, we do know there's a genetic influence on happiness. It's not huge, but it's, well, it's actually pretty moderate in size. We know some people are just kind of born happier than other people. So, um, so genetics do have an influence, but it doesn't mean that they were fated to be at a certain level of happiness. Um, our life situations, our life circumstances certainly influence our happiness. If we are living in poverty, if we're in an abusive relationship, if we're, um, you know, if we don't um, have our basic needs met, we're not going to be happy. Once we have our basic needs met, then certain things certainly can like push us a little bit higher, you know, higher or lower, you know, having a, we were talking about connection earlier, having a partner um, uh, or just friends, you know, people in our lives that we can really connect to is really important. Uh, having health uh, and not being in chronic pain, those kind of things. Um, having money, I can talk a whole, a lot about money and happiness. It's a whole subject. Um, so our life circumstances matter to happiness. Um, also, um, but what I focus on in my research is like, what are the things that we can actually do to uh, affect our, our happiness and well-being, right? So by what kinds of things can we, how, how do we change the ways that we think and the ways that we act in our daily lives that can uh, either make us happier or less happy? So, so I guess those are kind of the three categories, sort of genetics, our life circumstances, and sort of behaviors and ways of thinking that can affect happiness. Um, so social interaction, for example, I think is really critical to happiness. So people who are engaged in, in sort of connection, social interaction are gonna be happier. And that's something that you can increase. Now it doesn't have, it can be different for different people. So for some people, it could be, if you're an extrovert and you just love interacting with lots of different people on a daily basis, admittedly it's hard to do today. Um, uh, or some people just like to connect with one or two really close people in their lives. Uh, both are things that can satisfy our need to connect or our need to belong, which uh, as we know is really, really important to happiness. Um, yeah. Oh, hold on. Michael, you need to be muted, unmuted again. Oh. Okay. Uh, you've written ab about a couple of things that have been hot topics in the therapy world. Uh, com compassion, self-compassion, and gratitude. So I'd like to start off with the importance of gratitude and what uh, what we can learn from that. Sure. Um, yeah, I've done a, quite a bit of research on gratitude. Um, mostly what we do in our research is um, our experiments where we experimentally assign some people to express more gratitude in their lives and as opposed to other people who are assigned to do something else. Generally, our control groups are doing something more neutral, like keeping track of their daily activities. Um, a lot of interventions involve writing gratitude letters. So we find that, so gratitude is basically, um, I guess you can think of it as a way about thinking about the world, about yourself, about the people in your life, that really is just a more positive way of thinking, right? So when you're, when you're grateful for your mom, when you're grateful for your health, you're just sort of looking at the positive side of life as opposed to thinking about like what you don't have, you know, sort of focus on what you already have. Um, and, and it's interesting, I, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, like some people, I know some, sometimes it really strikes me, like I'll be really grateful for like buildings, like, you know, and who built those buildings and the architects and the builders and like, it's just amazing that we have these buildings that we just take for granted completely. So gratitude is kind of an antidote to taking things for granted, right? We, we mostly take things for granted in our lives, many things in our lives, including the people in our lives. So in, um, in gratitude, one of the main, main, I guess, impacts of gratitude is it makes us feel more connected when we're to other people and we're grateful for them. So in our interventions, our kind of bread and butter intervention is we ask people to write gratitude letters to important people in their lives. So you might, add, you might write a gratitude letter to, your, to one of your parents or to a mentor, to your kid, to your colleague, to your friend. And then that makes you really, um, yeah, it makes you feel, it strengthens that relationship, it makes you feel more connected to them. And so that 
can it can make people happier in many many ways and i i should note um a, a more recent study we actually compared there are different ways of expressing gratitude you can write a like a like a list right kind of count your blessings write a list of what you're grateful for you can write a letter to someone um and so we actually compared that in a study because i think no one's ever compared them in a single experiment and we we actually found that what's called social gratitude was more powerful so gra gratitude for other people as opposed to things and you can sort of imagine that's more powerful um but also letter writing in the form of kind of a narrative or a letter is more powerful again again because i think as opposed to a list because you can imagine a list is you have to be really genuinely grateful to like think about each item on the list and be like oh i'm so grateful for whatever it is the opportunities i have in life you know but it, it's always easier it's, it's always more powerful when you can really kind of elaborate on your on what you're grat grateful for i also want to add sorry i'm talking a lot but i just want to add to that is that sometimes gratitude can backfire and actually any kind of effort to become happier can backfire and so I do want to have some caveats here because I don't want to say like, oh, all these things are wonderful. It's going to make you all happy. Um, there's lots of ways that gratitude can backfire. But the main way is when people, when someone is depressed and they are asked to be grateful, that can make them feel more depressed and make them feel guilty over not being grateful enough or not expressing gratitude. It make them feel if people, uh, if, if someone is so depressed that they might be suicidal, it can make them feel like they're more of a burden on their friends and family, they could actually increase suicidality. So I, do, I just want to kind of add that caveat that you have to really be, it's a nuanced thing. You have to be kind of sensitive to who you're, uh, you know, recommending gratitude to. Yeah, no, that's very, it's very important because sometimes ideas come through in the therapy world that are terrific ideas for a lot of people, but actually would be the wrong ideas for others. Uh, so doing a good assessment and determining who gratitude might work for and who might just might make them more unhappy. Now, what about the question of compassion and self-compassion? Because I see an interesting, some interesting developments. There's been a lot of talk about the importance of self-compassion. And, and I think that's been very helpful uh, and uncovered an area which there hadn't been a lot of thinking about before in the therapy world. And then there's the idea of compassion for others as being the key. To, to being happy. So what are your thoughts about that? Sure, sure. No, I'd love to talk about that. Actually, I don't know as much about self-compassion. Um, I haven't done research on it, although we are literally designing a study right now to, to study it. I think it's a, just a fantastic approach. And in, especially because something like self-worth, a sense of self-worth and self-esteem is so hard to budge, as we know. And in my book, that I have a book called The How of Happiness, and I didn't, people ask me, why don't you have a chapter on self-esteem? And like, and the reason I said, and I say the reason I don't, I didn't is that I didn't know of any kind of intervention to, to sort of increase self-esteem, but anything, but I think self-compassion is something that could actually bolster a sort of your sense of self-worth. But this idea that you, you, what you say to yourself is what a kind friend might say to you is just, I, I think it's really powerful. So I don't know as much about it. So I'm not going to say much about it. I'll leave it to the, to other experts. But in terms of compassion for others, um, we have done lots of research where we ask people to help others, right? Um, and it's not, which is a little bit different from compassion because you can help without feeling compassion, but I think they often go together. Um, but I think that's so interesting and so powerful in lots of ways. Obviously, when you do kind acts for others, it makes you feel like a good person. It makes you feel more connected to other people. It makes you feel like the whole world is interconnected. Kind of like during the pandemic, we see a lot of people reaching out and helping the, their kids second grade teacher with Zoom or they help their elderly neighbors and deliver groceries to them, things like that. And we just feel like you're more, we're all kind of interdependent. We're all part of this sort of, we're all human. It makes us feel all kind of connected. Um, but also I often say that, well, I actually I would, like to see what you all think because you're the experts like a lot of i guess my, my intuition is a lot of people's problems are associated with or maybe even caused by kind of too much self-focus right you're kind of too absorbed on yourself obviously there are times that self-focus is important but when there's too much it can be toxic and by helping others and, and sending kind of compassion to others you're taking you're taking direction attention off yourself and onto other people. And I think it's almost always good to take the attention off yourself. 
not always, but almost always into something else, whether it could be a hobby or work when you're in flow, right? That's another approach to, to happiness or when you're helping someone else. And there's studies that show, for example, even if you have a serious disease, if you help others with the same disease, you're gonna be better off, not just in happiness, but actually in terms of physical health as well. So directing your attention to something else that's important in, in your life and contributing something to, somehow to society gives you meaning too. I guess we haven't really talked about that much, but happiness and meaning, I think, often go together. There's a lot of debates about sort of eudaimonic versus hedonic well-being. And I, I think those are interesting and important, but I, but I think mostly they go together because it, it feels good to have meaning. And when you contribute to society or even just to your neighborhood, it gives you meaning and it makes you happier, like in a deep way. Uh, you know, it reminds me when you're speaking of a, a famous story about Dr. Milton Erickson. Do you know much about him? Uh, a little he, bit. He, he was a very uh, progressive, interesting kind of therapist who really got to know his clients very, very quickly. And there's a story, I'll ask Emily to put it on because I think it's worth, it really did something to me and when I was thinking about my clinical practice about the African Violet Queen and that Bill O'Hanlon tells. And this was a woman, and I'll be very brief because I want to give you more time, but this is a woman um, in Milwaukee who was famous for being totally depressed, living alone in her house, hardly going out except to go to church every week. And Milton Erickson was kind of a hit, he did clinical hypnosis, but he got to, he looked for the core of how he could help someone make a change quickly. And this woman had a lot of therapy out of depression, probably talking about herself, how her husband left her, all the sad things in her life. So he was asked to go to her house when he was in a conference in, in Milwaukee. So he met her, he got a tour of the house, and I'm making a very long story short, but basically, he saw she had a, a greenhouse of African violets. So he said to her, you know, you're a very religious person and you're a member of your church. What if you sent an African violet to, to every member of your church who had a birth, a death, a, a marriage, a confirmation, just a little note wishing them well. He spent an hour with her. He went back to Arizona where he lives and he hadn't heard from her. 20 years later, he got a, someone sent him a newspaper article said, African Violet Queen dies, thousands at her funeral. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And, and she didn't need any more therapy. Story. Right? She didn't need any more therapy because... That was it. That was yeah. it. And it's not to say that therapy, long-term therapy, everything else, but it just shows finding that one key and helping people show compassion towards others can make an incredible difference. I love that. I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to... I see Emily sent the link through the chat. I'm yeah. going to um, use that myself. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about hedonic adaptation and what that's all about, what you've learned and what therapists can learn sure, from, sure. from that research you did. So hedonic adaptation, I have a book called The Myths of Happiness that's mostly all about hedonic adaptation. So hedonic adaptation is basically the phenomenon that human beings are so good at getting used to changes in our lives, their lives, uh, both positive changes and negative changes, but especially positive changes. So so we, uh, even when really good things happen, we get married, we, we get a new job that we've always wanted, we move to a new city, you know, we lose weight. Um, at first, it's wonderful. Um, but then over time, we tend to kind of go back to our baseline. And um, with negative events, that, that's, that's true, too. There's lots of data show that, for example, um, after divorce, the average time that people go back to baseline is it's a pretty long time, four to five years. But it's still, you know, I, I have these graphs that show how people kind of go back. And I actually have a friend who went through a really, really terrible divorce with custody battles. And I sent her that graph. And she said to me one time, she said, Sonia, I look at that graph every day, <laughs> you know, like to just remind her, like things will get better. So divorce, four to five years, bereavement, four to five years, job loss, four to five years. Interesting. Um, so, so although there's some, there's some life events like uh, severe disability that people on average don't actually return to the baseline. Um, but especially with positive things, we, we buy a new house, we move to a nicer apartment, we buy a car, you know, we, um, you know, something nice happens to us. And then, and then uh, we, at first it's wonderful that it's the news, some research shows it's really the news of it that is the biggest reward. It's like you win the lottery, you know what the best day of winning the lottery is? it's getting the news that you won the lottery <laughs> and it's kind of downhill after that. 
Um, now, obviously, when it comes to money, it depends on how you spend the money. So you could spend money in ways that can make you happy for a long time. Um, but anyway, having said that, ad adaptation is really powerful. And it's again, it's very good in the case of negative things that we're so resilient on average, at least two thirds of us, some research, a lot of research shows that about two thirds of people are very resilient, a third are less resilient. Um, but with positive things, it's not so good, right? We kind of wish we didn't adapt to our spouses, right? That we could like be in that honeymoon period all the time. Although I guess theory, evolutionary theories, theorists would say head adaptation is like a good thing. You know, we can't, it's like, imagine if we were in love all the time. <laughs> I mean, like in that high state of intense, passionate love, we would never get anything done, right? We couldn't like get our work done. We couldn't raise kids. Um, so, um, so, this, so, 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 adaptation is adaptive, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's something that we should keep in mind for negative things to know that we're more resilient than we think we are. For positive things to know that when we adapt to a new job and it's not as exciting anymore, then that doesn't mean there's something wrong with us and we should change jobs. Like we all know people who are constantly like changing jobs, changing partners, buying new handbags, buying new shoes, buying new cars, constantly renovating their homes. I remember writing a, my, when I was writing my book about this, I was at a colleague's house and she was like renovating her bathroom or like putting a new deck. And it was like always people in California are constantly renovating their homes. And I'm like, you know, this is not going to make you happier. Like, well, yeah, but she's like, it'll make me happier for a while and then I'll renovate the next thing that'll make me happier. Anyway, um, it's something that's good to sort of to keep in mind that it's a human phenomenon that we need to sort of be cognizant of. Okay, I just got to ask you one more question, then I'll open it up because this is kind of a very Reader's Digest version <laughs> of, of your books. And, you know, they're so, they're so full and interesting. But you, know, you also talk about what determines happiness, how much is in our genes, how much is life circumstances, what's under our control. So why don't you say a few things about that, and then we'll see what people have to ask you. Oh, what's, okay. So, well, I think I, um, I mentioned this at the beginning, right? So in terms of what determines happiness. So our genes are not under our control, presumably. I mean, we can't yet sort of have designer genes, um, especially after we're born. So, so again, so there's a genetic influence to happiness. Um, but I, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's something to be pessimistic about because there's a, there are genetic influences on pretty much everything, you know, on our weight, on our blood pressure, on whether we get depressed or, get diabetes, or even, you know, it turns out that um, preference for jazz music has a genetic basis. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, but it's so just because there, you know, some of us are kind of have a more predisposition to be here versus here versus here, we can still kind of move up and down. It just means that we have to work harder if we sort of start at a lower level. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so that so genetics something you can't change. Our life circumstances matter, as I talked about before. You know how much money we have, whether we're healthy, whether we're married, you know where we live, what kind of job we have, and we have some control over that. I mean, in in the Western world, or lots of people that like maybe we know have a good amount of control over their lives, and they can change their life if they want. They could get divorced, they can move, they can get a new job. Um, lots of people in the world don't have that much control over their circumstances, so I don't usually tell people, I mean, unless you're in an abusive relationship or you're living in a very bad situation, you know, try to get out of that. But if you're, if that's not your situation, making your circumstances better, or, or it's not like the, it's not really the secret to happiness. The secret is more of like how you approach and how you think about those circumstances, how you, um, yeah, how you behave and think in your daily life that really matters. Now your daily life could be an obstacle, right? Because maybe you have a commute that's so terrible that just like ruins your life kind of every day. So that it would be good to change. But there's lots of the ways that we can think. We already talked about gratitude. We talked about compassion, helping others. Those are all ways that we can um, approach each day that can make us happier. Um, and there's others. Okay, I did actually, I have one more question then we'll open it up. You know, we have an audience of therapists here. Uh, of everything, you know, all the research you've done and the people you've met, if you had to give one bit of advice to therapists that, that you think would be useful uh, in their work with people, what would that be? I think it would be about the backfiring effects of these, some of these activities, because I think therapists already know, yeah, yeah, it's good to 
savor and help others and be grateful and, and engage in meditate, do meditation or whatever. All these, there's all these, there's these toolkits that like we all know about, you know, there's not, they're not rocket science. Um, but all, almost all of them can actually sometimes undermine our happiness or people's happiness. So we just have to be really, really careful. I think any, I mean, any good therapist, of course, is going to tailor what they're going to say to every client anyway. So it's all sort of common sense for you probably. Um, but I already mentioned with gratitude, right? It can make you feel like more of a burden or it can make you feel guilty or indebted. You know, in some languages, the word for grateful is the same as the word for indebted. Now, mm. I don't think it's so bad to feel indebted because that could actually prompt some good positive behavioral change in, our, in people's lives, but something to keep in mind that it can actually be unpleasant to feel grateful. With, with um, kindness and generosity and compassion, that could also have backfiring effects. So I think I do want to mention that too. Um, there's research on what's called visible as opposed to invisible helping or, or support. So, so visible social support is when you say to your elderly parent, oh, let me, let me help you. I'm going to get those groceries for you. I'm going to do this thing for you, which th that could actually undermine their sense of autonomy and competence. It can make them feel worse, right? Invisible is, when, is the little ways that we can help each other that are not necessarily, yeah, that are almost like hidden from you. And that, that is a really positive way to help. Um, but when you help others also, there are lots of people, especially women, that, that spend too much time caring for others and not enough time caring for themselves. So that's a problem. Um, when you help others, you sometimes might feel exploited. It might feel like a burden to you. So, so I don't want to just blanketly say, oh, tell it, you know, helping as a, you know, a compassion is always good. Sometimes you have compassion fatigue. And with anything, I mean, one of the ways that I like to summarize all the approaches to happiness is in terms of moderation, kind of, you know, that idea of the Aristotelian mean, that everything in moderation, gratitude in moderation, kindness in moderation, mm -hmm. even connection, right? You don't want to spend all your time connecting with other people. You also need to focus on yourself or on your work or on intellectual pursuits, creativity, you know, savoring, you know, you don't want to spend all your time savoring. I mean, one example, I, uh, when my, one of my kids was little, I was, I really got into reading Harry Potter to her and I loved it. It was just such a beautiful thing. We were connecting. It was also an intellectual exercise and she was reading, I was we were reading together. And my husband was like, you're spending too much time reading to her. <laughs> like I was sort of neglecting other things. So again, even that, even something as totally innocuous and positive as like reading to your kid could be bad, right? If it's done too much, right? So, so, so that's, I guess that's one final thing I'd say, moderation. <laughs> That's very, I appreciate your professional and personal reflections. Okay, we've got a lot of people out there from all mm -hmm. over the place. Mm -hmm. And we'll let them, Emily, who would like to ask a question? Um, so I think we'll start with a question that was emailed to me. The person's having difficulty logging on, but really wanted this question addressed. Um, so a few years ago, she started researching happenstance and read the book on how is happiness. Mm -hmm. She was really fascinated with your theory that we all have a starting point. So this may not be the correct word, but a happiness point that each of us um, is perhaps inherited, which is part of our happiness base point. Mm -hmm. um, and so if a person has a very low measure of happiness, how can they work to develop a more conscious level to improve their lives, especially as young adults? Yeah. Um, thank you. So uh, I think I called it a set point. I don't quite believe in the idea of a set point. I mean, it, it exists. It's just I don't like to refer to it as a set point because people tend to overinterpret that as meaning like, oh, we all have this set point, like mine is a two and yours is a five and hers is a, uh, an eight, but it's not, it's really much more kind of malleable than that. And if, if anything, you can think of it as a set range. Some people are kind of like between a two and a six and others maybe between a six and a 10. Um, and so we can move within that range and their genetic influences on that. But this is all speculation, really. We don't know, um, but just research shows that, you know, there's this, there's a genetic influence, but just because your set point maybe, or your set range is a little low, like maybe you want it to be, you want to be higher. It doesn't mean you can't, as I said, you can't move higher. And so how do we improve? How do we change that baseline? We can do that. It just would, it just takes effort. By the way, I should note that not everyone is willing to put the effort in. I've talked to lots of people who are like, you know what, this is too much work. I'd rather be at whatever. I'd rather be at a five and I'm fine with that. I don't need to be happier. I don't, you know, it's a cost benefit analysis, just like with anything, right? Um, 
and that's fine, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sort of telling everyone they should be happier if they don't want to. Um, but if you really want to be happier, there are sort of strategies people can use and we've already talked about some of them, right? So more engage in more gratitude, connect more with other people, help contribute more. Uh, one of my favorite ways to summarize kind of how people can improve their happiness comes from self-determination theory, which is one of my favorite theories these days, which is there's sort of three ways that people can become happier. One is through connecting with others, and that includes lots and lots of approaches, including just, just having more social interactions. We've, we've done studies where we ask people, just engage in more social interactions this week than you normally do. People get happier, a lot happier, actually. Um, connect more with us or connect with your partner more or your kid more. Um, contributing to society, so any way you can help another person or your neighborhood or society in general, that can make people happier. And the third bucket, so it's like the three buckets, connecting with others, contributing to society. The third one is personal growth. Anything you can do to grow as a person. Again, that, those are very, very uh, kind of broad buckets, right? There's so many ways you can grow as a person. You can take cooking classes, you can garden, you can travel, you know, you can, I don't know, just do something with your kids that help you grow as a person too. Um, so I, I kind of like to summarize it that way, but there's tons and tons of strategies. Um, my book, The How of Happiness, has 12 chapters, and each of those chapters were, is about different kinds of ways to become happier, kind of above your set point. Um, and that was published in 2008, so that was 12 years ago. And all of every strategy, I'm actually um, revising it right now. I got the go ahead for my publisher to, to update it, which is a big um, task. Um, but all, it's everything in that book now is still true. It's still accurate. There's just a lot more research to add to each chapter to support like you know, each strategy. Well, we can't wait for the newest version to come out. Um, our next question is from Debbie. Debbie, are you there? Debbie? Mm. Okay, um, her question was, if clients focus on what they don't have, does research show that the gratitude exercises can reverse the rumination? Um, theoretically, yes. So that is basically what gratitude is, right? It's a focus on what you have as opposed to what you don't have. Um, and it is an antidote to rumination. Um, I actually spent the first maybe 10 years of my career studying rumination which as you know, is kind of this like circular thinking where you kind of, instead of going from A to B, C to D, you're going from A back to B to back to A, kind of in a circle. Um, and um, so it, I don't know, I think there are some studies that actually try to measure rumination and, and show that gratitude reduces it. I've, I have not done that myself, but theoretically it should, um, just like any kind of thinking about something else. Um, uh, I think kindness can also, right, reduce rumination, right, when you're focusing on, like, the African violence, right, the woman, yeah, that, that, would, that would reduce rumination about yourself if you're focusing on other people. Um, so, anyway, the answer is yes, but I actually don't know of a particular study that has shown that. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Lindsay Rayfuse. Lindsay, are you there? Hi, Lindsay. Oh, we can't hear you. Huh, a few microphone issues today. Um, I believe her question was if you can speak to any cross-cultural findings. Ah, thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, we actually have quite a few cross-cultural studies on different approaches to happiness. And they're obviously cultures are different. So, I mean, you could argue that there's certain um, universals like well i mean i hesitate to use the word universal but um you know most people do want to be happy although they might cross cultures or they might define happiness differently um in terms of cultural differences we we have found some interesting differences i'll just mention two we did a study on gratitude in south korea comparing to the u.s and we found that People in South Korea did not get happier after they wrote gratitude letters, but Americans did. And I remember giving a talk in Seoul, like right after I got the data, and I was telling everyone about the data. I'm like, I don't understand why. And I had a very interesting um, 
very interesting comments, you know, about, about how, well, in Korean culture, when you express gratitude, there's sort of this expectation of reciprocation and, and that gratitude could actually be a kind of a mixed emotional experience that you feel sort of guilty when you express gratitude. And also one of my favorite things that, that I found out from my, the Korean audience was that like in the US and Western Europe, I think too, you know, parents love it when their kids thank them, right? Like kids tend to be notoriously ungrateful. Um, but in Korea, it's almost considered insulting to be thanked, to, uh, to thank your parent because like what they're doing is their duty and it's almost, right, it's almost like insulting that, that you would need to thank them for doing something that, that is their duty. Um, so anyway, that's a, that was an interesting finding. And then the more recently, we did a study um, at looking at recalling acts of kindness in um, Hong Kong and the United States. And what we found was that um, in, in collectivist countries, like in Asian countries, there's more of a focus on kind of the family and the in-group. And we asked people to either think about acts of kindness they've done to friends and family or to strangers. And Americans were equally happy whether the acts of kindness were done to friends and family and strangers, but people in Hong Kong were happier when they recalled acts of kindness towards friends and family than towards strangers, as though it was like more rewarding or made them happier to help uh, their families more, uh, people close to them. So that we thought that was interesting. Anyway, so that we do find some cross-cultural differences. I mean, not, not as much as you'd expect. Again, I think that kind of the desire for happiness is fairly, again, near, near universal, but how we pursue happiness, of course, might be kind of constrained a bit by cultural norms and cultural practices and beliefs. Great. Um, and next we have Joanna. Joanna, are you there? I'm there. Hi, Joanna. Hi. Um, so my question was about um, using the positive psychology interventions with people who are uh, severely, severely depressed. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned many of them backfire and um, that many of them are counterindicated with the severely depressed. So knowing that you said many, but not all, I wondered um, what ones fall outside of that, what ones are considered um, something you might think about using. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's such a hard question for me, not, not, not someone who doesn't work with severely depressed people, so I just don't have as many insights. I guess I would say the only thing that I could add is, because I think almost anything could backfire, right? Like if you tell people who are severely depressed to help others, you know, that, that could backfire too. Um, the, the one study that I keep thinking that did work with severely depressed women was the study that Marty Seligman did where he just he asked people to think of three good things every day that happened. And it, so it's like, a it's, it's just, you know, it's not a big burden. It's just sort of anything, three good things, right? The sun came out today and, you know, and, and he reported that really helped that alleviated um, significantly their depressive symptoms. So three good things. Um, I don't really have that much more insight into that. Like it just has to be, I guess it would have to be tailored to the person, but just something that doesn't overwhelm them, right? Doesn't make them feel even, right? Even more of a burden or a failure because they can't do the whatever you're asking them to do. So yeah, sorry, I am not um, an expert in this area, but but just I think just being cognizant, just being aware that these yeah. approaches might backfire is like the most important thing, right? Um, so are you saying, um, if, what I do now is I sometimes would consider positive psychology interventions, but kind of in a light, low expectation yes, way? Yes, yes. Okay. I guess I would say, yeah, light, low expectation, or at least start small. Yeah. And then when they're feeling a little better, maybe go to the, you know, the second step. Yeah, it's baby steps, I would say. I, okay. I don't know, small steps, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And next we have Sharon. Sharon, hi. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So um, you, alert, you um, alluded to earlier um, in your talk that the quality or kind of connection that we have with others can influence happiness. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, so, well, there's some work showing that kind of deeper connection is more critical to happiness than kind of casual, you know, surface level connection. It's sort of obvious almost. But uh, I guess my favorite theory of connection that I think is just so powerful that I think answers your question is a theory by Harry Reese, R-E-I-S. 
and he's a researcher and professor at the University of Rochester. And his theory is that the key to relationships or kind of the key to connection is to feel understood, valued, and cared for or loved, right? Understood, valued, and cared for. And so, and to make the other person feel understood, valued, and cared for. Now that's so hard, right? How do you get there? I mean, and he has, there's research to suggest that to feel it, like if you want to feel understood, you need to show a little bit of yourself to others, right? You need to disclose some of yourself. There's some people that are so, you probably have clients that are just so kind of private that they're so closed and that you can never really be known if some, you can't be understood when you're not known. Um, and just truly, obviously truly listen to other people so you can make them feel understood. And to really, because in lots of people, actually, it's so interesting. I when, I when I first found out about this theory, I thought, oh, that sounds kind of obvious. But the more I thought about it, the more powerful it seemed to me. But I've actually asked a lot of people about it. People who are like, for example, in a very happy marriages. And a lot of them say, I feel loved. I feel valued or appreciated, but I don't feel understood. So I, I that's just like a key that's missing, I think, in a lot of relationships. So so I, I, I want to, I really, I want to write a book about this, about how to feel, how to help people feel understood, loved and cared for, and appreciated because it's really super difficult. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the key. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, an email question that's come in is someone has said, I've encountered some people who would be considered poor or without stuff who seem happy compared to those with much stuff. Mm -hmm. How does this insight make, or how does this sighting make sense? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so lots of research on sort of wealth or stuff and, and happiness and money and happiness. Um, it's, it would probably be, take me too long to kind of summarize it all. The, the bottom line is money does make a difference, but it, what, what matters is how you spend it or how you not spend it. Um, and it really matters if, if your basic needs are met, right? So if money can help you from being poor, then it matters a lot. So we're assuming that, that these are all people who kind of have their basic needs met, but some of them have their basic needs met plus a lot more and some of them, you know, just a little bit more. Um, and again, I think it's about how you spend your money and, and kind of what your attitude to life is. You know, we've already talked about people who are compassionate to others or grateful for what they have are going to be happier. Um, you could have a lot of things in your house, right? But you're not grateful and not compassionate and you don't savor everyday little things. So you're not gonna be, be so as happy. Um, there's actually some research shows that the more money you have, the less likely you are the less able you are to savor the little things in life. Like, I think one study was just gave people like really nice dark chocolates and people, and when you're kind of thinking about money, you're less likely to savor the chocolate, which is interesting. So, or if you have just ex have had a lot of experiences in life, it's a hedonic adaptation, right? You kind of adapt and you're like, well, what else is there? To, you know, I've had it all, right? You, you're kind of not as happy by little things. So. So there's lots of ways that you can be happy without money as long as your basic needs are met because you're, you're able, if you're able to connect with others, if you're able to be positive and grateful and compassionate. Um, but in terms of spending money, you know, research shows that spending money on experiences makes people happier than spending them on, spending it on things. You might know about this already. So if you, it's like if you have a hundred dollars, spend it on having, you know, a dinner with your friends or getting a massage or traveling somewhere as opposed to buying a new a bigger object that you put in your closet or you put on the shelf or you put in the garage. Um, spending money on helping others, spending money on connecting with other people or on personal growth. I remember I talked about those three buckets that make people happier, personal growth, connecting with others and contributing to society. If you spend money in those ways, that's gonna make you happier uh, than if you don't. So um, yeah, so I, I think it's a fascinating topic actually. There's a book that I would recommend called Happy Money by uh, uh, some colleagues of mine uh, that I'm friends with, um, Norton and Dunn. And uh, yeah, so if you're interested in this topic, that's a good book to read, Happy Money. Great. Um, someone without a mic asks, do affirmations help increase happiness? Mm -hmm. So for example, I am at peace, where you really don't feel it, but you say it anyway. And then a second question is, are females happier than males or vice versa? Or what is your, what is your research uh, shown? Sure, I'll start with the second one. No gender differences in happiness. Um, pretty much no gender differences except, well, it depends what you look at. So, so 
women are more labile, so they kind of go up and down more. Men are a little bit more, have more of an equilibrium. And then women also have been shown to have higher highs and lower lows. So women are more likely to be depressed, of course, clinically depressed, but they're also more likely to be super happy. Um, but on average, kind of, there's no gender difference, but there are differences in, at the highs and the lows. Um, in terms of affirmation, I, there's one study I that I know of that was published in Psych Science that showed that affirmations did not do anything, actually might have had some harm. Um, but I, I don't know much research on it. I, I think, I feel like it could be positive depending on the person that kind of like just positive thinking could, could it, I mean, in part it could be a placebo effect, but just repeating something could make it, make you believe it more. So I don't want to say no, never. I think it depends on how the person is implementing that strategy. Um, uh, but again, the one study that I know did not show that affirmations were effective. Okay. Um, someone's asking, are there any resources or suggestions of who else um, can, uh, can we be reading regarding happiness? Other than your books, of course. Right. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I mean, there's lots of books that are more, well, again, the um, Happy Money, I like. Um, Barb Fredrickson's book um, on positivity. She has one on positivity and one on love. Love 2.0 and positivity. I think those books are really good. So Fredrickson as you may know, just research on the, the sort of the power of positive emotions and how they can serve to neutralize negative emotions, which is really relevant. Uh, Mike Chick sent me high on flow. I think it's just classic, you know, to learn about flow and like the sense, this feeling when you're really absorbed and engaged in something, you lose track of time, you lose track of self. So that's really one way that can contribute to happiness. Um, and I've always liked actually the Dalai Lama's books. I mean, they're, they're not about research, but he really gets it right. Actually, one of the first books that I've ever read on happiness was, is The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. And he definitely got it right. And actually, he's someone who talks to scientists all the time, um, just interested in like what the scientists have to say. So I'm sure there are more that I'm forgetting right now. But um, uh, yeah, there, there's lots out there. OK, um, I think we have time for one last question. I think it's Andrej. Are you there? Hi. Andrej? Oh. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. The, so, the, so the question is, what part seems to play more important role in happiness? Being happy with your life or being happy in your life? Oh. Um, good question. Um, I don't think I can answer. I think they're, I don't think I know the answer to that. I think they're both important. Um, although they, they relate to different things. So for example, being happy with your life is more highly related to money. All right. So people who are wealthier are more likely to report being satisfied with their lives, but no more likely to report that they're sort of having a particular positive emotions at any point in time. So they have different correlates, but I, I would say they're both important. Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, that, those were all the questions that we have answered today. Great. Um, yeah. Um, again, Michael, are you there? Hold on. Oh, there you go. Well, I guess I want to say thank you very much, uh, Sonia. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure. You know, we're a field that looks at unhappiness mm -hmm. and knows a lot about unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And I think the work of Seligman and your work um, teaches us a lot about what happiness can look like and how we can help people. So really appreciate you taking the time. We have a little tradition at the end of every one of our sessions. We open up all the mics and the screens and let everyone say thank you. I guess now I know it's a gratitude exercise. I never thought of that. Uh, but it's a way to say thank you uh, for all of us for spending this time uh, with us uh, in this very interesting modern way. So thank you very much and we'll open it up. Everyone can unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.